Hello everyone, uh, welcome um, um, today. We have this, this is our fourth talk um, this year at LSE uh, Health Society and we have the honor to present Jennifer Clausen um, that uh, is an, an expert on the field of uh, value-based healthcare and that would be the focus of our talk today. We'll let uh, uh, Jennifer uh, give her presentation uh, initially, and then we'll have the, um, the time to for some questions that I would ask you to put on the q and or in the chat, and we'll let you um, ask them afterwards. Jennifer Clausen is a partner and director at the Boston Consulting Group and the global coordinator of the firm's value-based healthcare program across all sectors of the healthcare industry. She's the co-author of the recent book, The Patient Priority, addressing the, uh, the growing crisis confronting the global healthcare sector and why we must put the patient and the delivery of outcomes that matter to patients at the front front. She led the BCG team to establish ECOM, a global nonprofit health outcomes measurement organization with co-founders Harvard Business School and the Karolinska Institute. She regularly leads um, workshops and presents at pre uh, conference globally, and she has written numerous articles on value-based healthcare and its impacts across pro uh, providers, suppliers, and policymakers. In her more than 20 years of BCG, at BCG, Jennifer had supported a um, broad range of major healthcare uh, client organizations in a wide range of topics, including strategy, growth, and transformation, sales force effectiveness, and commercial excellence. Jennifer earned her undergrad degree from Harvard College and an MBA from Columbia University. Thank you for joining us, and I'll leave you the floor um, to present you a little bit more on your book. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so very much, Hugo, for the invitation and for that warm uh, welcome. Um, so let me uh, just set up a little bit of what I'd love to chat about today, but then make sure that we leave uh, plenty of time at the end for, for questions. So what I thought we would could do is, is I would briefly present um, learnings uh, that we have uh, accumulated over the years on the transition from uh, uh, where we are in terms of uh, healthcare systems around the world to value-based care, drawing from our book, The Patient Priority. Then I wanted to talk specifically about six unlocks that we see are critical to improving the value um, to make sure that our sustainable uh, healthcare systems uh, can be transformed. And finally, leave time for debate and, and discussion with, with all of you. So without further ado, I'll just jump in um, and start off with, you know, what is value-based healthcare and, and why do we need it uh, today? And to do that, I think it's always important to think a little bit about where have we come from? Uh, where is uh, healthcare system transformation? We're always trying to transform something around the healthcare system, but where specifically has that, um, that come from? And so, you know, at the start, if we go way back um, to Florence Nightingale, um, she wrote in, in some of her early writings that there are three dimensions of outcomes. There are the relieved, in other words, those who've gotten care, um, the unrelieved, those who didn't get so much good care, and the dead. Um, so this is obviously quite a, a crude definition, uh, but some of the early thinking on um, on outcomes. She actually went on to do a lot in terms of um, obviously improving public health, improving sanitation, uh, and using data to do that in interesting ways that hadn't necessarily been done before. So she was a, uh, a pioneer in many ways, uh, despite this very crude definition of, of outcomes early days. If we move on from, from there, though, uh, another definition is what Ernest Kahneman said uh, and he was a, a medical professional in the 1930s that uh, he was under the belief that every hospital uh, should follow every patient it treats. And <laughs> that would help them basically figure out uh, what they were doing well, uh, and more importantly, where they could improve. Um, so that was, I think, a, um, a bit of a contrarian view uh, in terms of practicing medicine, the way of, of tracking each patient uh, even after the, the treatment had been delivered, uh, but I think also set the foundation for where we are moving today. Then many of you, I'm sure, have studied or uh, heard about at least uh, Don Abedian uh, and his structure for thinking about healthcare system measurement 
Um, and he was very much of the idea that outcomes uh, are the ultimate uh, validation of medical care, uh, especially the effectiveness and quality of medical care. And so he was writing in the, in the late 20th century about some of those things. And that led us then, I think, with all of these various inputs to the first book, if you will, on value-based healthcare uh, that defined it. And that came out in 2006, um, the book that was written by Michael Porter and Elizabeth Ticeberg called Redefining Healthcare. At the time, it was really pushed down um, negatively by medical doctors saying, who are these business school professors to tell us how to run our business? Uh, we're in the business of providing care. Uh, it's, it's science. Um, it's, not, um, it's not business school strategy. It's not competition strategy. Uh, but I think they had a, a novel idea that may have been ahead of its time. Uh, and their book, um, I think, defined it quite well. Uh, even though there may not have been that much in practice yet. So fast forward another 15 or so years to where we are today. Um, and I think why we need value-based healthcare today more than ever is because we have a series of, of crises that are uh, interrelated. And so these three crises uh, are the three that you see here. And I'll just highlight them briefly, but then show you a little bit more data about how uh, we think about each of these three interrelated crises. The first is a value crisis. In other words, we're spending more uh, and our spend for healthcare is growing at a faster rate than our uh, growth of GDP or our economic growth. Um, yet we're not getting better outcomes as a result for our patients and our populations. The second one is a crisis of evidence uh, where there's an increasing disconnect between where we spend trillions of dollars uh, in R&D for medical care, specifically mostly by uh, the industry, the, the life sciences industry, and then the decisions that need to be made by clinical teams in front of a patient and together with patients uh, and the disconnect that's growing there. And the third crisis, which is related to these two, is what we call the purpose crisis. In other words, many people go into uh, medicine and healthcare in general with the general aim of improving um, people's livelihoods, of caring for people, uh, of empathy, of care and giving back. Yet the jobs they're frequently asked to do um, are um, more disconnected with the patient care than we would all like. Um, so that involves you know, more of the uh, data processing, more time spent on coding and tracking, et cetera, uh, and has contributed to uh, what we call the purpose crisis, which can translate into burnout, attrition, people leaving the workforce uh, of healthcare uh, in record numbers. So if I take each of these in turn for a moment and just explain a little bit about what the data uh, tells us behind this, two slides I wanna share on the value crisis. Um, at a global level, if you will, our spend on healthcare, which you see on the left-hand side here is the dark red line, is, spend, is growing faster, uh, you can see by the slope of the curve, uh, versus the GDP growth, the, the economic growth uh, is the white line. Uh, whereas it was only 9% of GDP spend back in 2000, it's now increased to be 12%. And in some countries, as you can see on the right-hand side, like the US, uh, it's significantly more than that. So the US is a significant outlier in terms of uh, percent of GDP spent on healthcare. And as also shown on the left, despite sorry, on, on the right-hand side of the chart, despite the fact that uh, we're spending more on healthcare uh, per capita, we're not necessarily getting better outcomes. Um, and those who spend uh, the most in terms of those who are on the far right-hand side of the chart on the right-hand side, you know, you can see that the U.S. has lower outcomes than, say, um, Japan and a number of those other uh, red bubbles in the middle of the chart, which spend uh, half, if not less, as much per capita uh, and get better health-adjusted life expectancy. Now, that's a fairly crude outcome, I recognize. Um, there are many more outcomes beyond that one that we could measure, uh, but I think it's a proxy uh, that tells us that just spending more doesn't necessarily get us better outcomes. And spending more actually is worrying in another respect in that both the WHO and OECD have published figures previously saying that somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of what we spend is actually not improving the outcomes for the patients. It's actually waste. Now, that waste could be clarified in a number of different ways. It could be on medications that don't have the desired uh, impact for a specific population segment. It could be on repeated tests, lab tests, as 
uh, patients pop from one pro care provider to the next care provider uh, and, and all of their lab tests and, and um, uh, MRIs, et cetera, don't travel with them. Um, and then it could just be simply on some of the procedures that we do today in medicine, which have historical um, historical momentum behind them, but actually don't provide uh, relief for the patient or uh, an improvement in their in their life uh, and in their health status. So having said that, you know, this 20, 40 percent um, on both the spend and the outcomes uh, is the root of our value crisis. Another way to look at it, however, is in terms of inappropriate care or care that, you know, may not be um, generating the same results despite high levels of spend. And so specifically here, this is one example where we're looking at uh, knee replacement. And on the left hand side, you see each of the different bars being a different country versus the OECD average highlighted in the middle of the chart in yellow. Um, and we've selected here Germany just to do a deeper dive, not because Germany is necessarily uh, the best or the worst, but simply because Germany, as you can see by the data in OECD, does about 2x the average in terms of knee replacement per capita. And then when you look at that at a German population level, uh, you can see that it's significantly varies uh, by geography. So um, from those who do the most knee replacements are five times higher uh, in terms of the per capita knee replacement per 10,000 population versus the, the lowest region. So the highest ones and, and the lowest ones shown by the dark blue versus the dark red uh, on the map of Germany uh, on the, on the right-hand side. So the question underlying all of this obviously is um, what do, uh, what, what, constitutes the right level of, of knee replacement? Are there other things that can be done that also improve patient outcomes that don't involve a, an actual replacement of the joint, uh, physical therapy, lifestyle adjustment changes, et cetera, which may actually be adding more value because they get the same improvement for the patient um, at a lower cost for the healthcare system. So we want to avoid obviously going as far away of, of rationing, but I think showing that there's a 5X variation in Germany alone, uh, questions whether all of what we're doing in medicine uh, is incentivized in the right way and is actually appropriate care. So that's just another way of defining uh, in our mind what the value crisis is, the unwanted variation in, in the way that medicine is practiced. If we talk about the second crisis, then uh, you'll remember that that's the evidence crisis. And here I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of data points uh, to put it in context. We know that the um, there's an exponential increase in knowledge in medicine. If you look as a as a proxy uh, at the publications in PubMed, you can see the shape of this curve is exponential. Um, and now, obviously, there's incentives for publishing. There are more journals. All of that has changed over time. But I think we can all agree that there is infinite knowledge or, or exponential increase in knowledge that is harder and harder to assimilate as a care provider in terms of what's the latest and greatest uh, in terms of the patient I have in front of me at this moment. Despite this exponential increase, we're still lacking what I would say is true evidence. Uh, there was a study uh, a number of years ago in the BMJ Clinical Journal, which looked at over 3,000 interventions and said about half had sufficient levels of evidence. Um, but then if we go even more uh, uh, peel the onion one layer further, and we look at what evidence is in existence today, we've looked at some of the leading guidelines out there, um, American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology jointly have over 50 guidelines with over 7,000 recommendations. And there was a meta review of those um, that looked into to see how much of those had uh, a significant level of evidence behind them. And it was found to be that only 11% uh, of those over 7,000 recommendations had evidence at the highest level, which in this case was classified as being two, minimum two, uh, if not more, uh, randomized control trials or, or meta-analyses behind it. In other words, almost 90% of those guidelines didn't have at least two uh, randomized control trials. Um, so that's, I think, a, an alarming statistic, which uh, isn't as clear necessarily, and it contributes to um, the third crisis, which is we ask a lot of our clinical teams today uh, in terms of knowing the latest and et cetera, uh, but we don't necessarily give them the tools in terms of clinical decision support to sort through 
that ever increasing body of knowledge uh, to help find out where the true improvement areas are that's really gonna drive outcomes that are better for the patients. And so just a couple of numbers here um, on the corrosive crisis of purpose as we've called it, uh, that has a really high cost at the end of the day. And we see this day in, day out with the high numbers of people who are um, leaving or are burned out uh, in the medical profession and in the clinical teams. So having said that, when we look at these three crises in conjunction, we wanted to take a look and say, value-based healthcare we think is a way to unlock all three of these crises. Um, but what have we learned in the last 15 years since that first value-based healthcare book was published? Uh, where have people actually pursued this strategy? Uh, what have we learned from what they've done, et cetera? And so this is just a snapshot. It's not a complete list, but just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we have highlighted um, in the hundreds of journal articles that we read, the uh, many interviews, some site visits, et cetera, uh, with a range of organizations that you can see here that not only include uh, policymakers, but also include provider organizations, payer organizations, uh, life science companies, uh, not-for-profit associations, uh, and most importantly, also patient organizations. So, you know, we've taken a look at um, a large group of stakeholders that are participating in value-based healthcare to see what can we learn from them. So that's a little bit about, you know, why we, what is value-based healthcare uh, and, and why do we need it today to help us uh, fight those three crises, which are very um, top of mind for, for many of us in the field. So then if we think about what do we actually need to go forward, how can we unlock value and actually move towards a value-based healthcare system, uh, what I wanted to share with you was a view on what do we think are the six unlocks, as we call them, uh, in terms of uh, improving value um, in healthcare across all the different stakeholders. And so what I want to do is just take the, each of these in turn and talk through a couple of examples behind them. And the first and foremost starts with uh, outcome measurement and transparency. Uh, and I'll come to some examples of what we mean by that specifically. The second then is around patient-centric care delivery. Now this may seem completely obvious and, and to many it is, but I think the devil's really in the details. So how do we organize care around the patient and not necessarily in the way that we've always done it in medicine, which is more departmental, more siloed, um, more in line with our specialties, et cetera. But how can we reorient our thinking to make sure that we're following the patient through his or her journey uh, with multiple conditions, with multiple specialties, et cetera. The third unlock then becomes making sure that we incentivize for value and value improvement uh, rather than volume. And for value here, what we're talking about is improved patient outcome, uh, going back to that first point there, um, at the same or lower total cost uh, to treat that patient along his or her journey. Uh, so part of it is around paying, part of it is around value-based contracting, et cetera. But it's also thinking through what are the incentives, what are the behaviors that we want to see uh, across all of the different silos that we work towards, i.e. more prevention, for example, uh, and how can we make sure that we incentivize for that uh, and not, and we can move away from the fee-for-service environment, which is so prevalent today. The fourth unlock then becomes the use uh, and leveraging of data, technology, and digital tools not least of which uh, is to capture um, the outcomes, but also to be able to use those outcomes and put them back in the hands of clinical teams and patients to help make shared decision-making a reality uh, and to help make informed choices uh, on what's most important for each patient uh, on his or her journey. The fifth unlock then becomes something around regulation and governance. How can we make sure that the policies we have in place foster collaboration, foster innovation, um, allow working across the silos um, and really help drive the whole mission forward. Some of this is creating new policies, but some of it's also looking at the policies which are on the books already and uh, removing some of those which may be barriers to the collaboration and the innovation which we need to see. And finally, the sixth unlock is really uh, one around leadership, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. There are three types of leadership uh, traits that we see as critical and, and where we've seen this uh, exemplified in the example organizations we've looked at in the book of what works well. So 
let me just talk through each of these in turn. And I wanted to uh, start with the first one, outcome measurement and transparency. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is to really uh, sort of take a personal stance on it. So let me just share a bit of a personal story. This is my dad um, uh, going on a uh, log flume ride in the local amusement park with, with two of his grandkids. Um, and, you know, for a, a man in his in mid 70s, uh, you know, what's most important to, to somebody who might have a prostate uh, cancer diagnosis is is really um, is more defined than five year disease specific survival, which is what typically is shown. So the OECD can give us data on how different um, uh, countries compare on that five year disease specific survival. But you know, you've heard the stories. The the the, uh, the the saying goes that prostate cancer is a disease you die with, as opposed as a disease you die from. So people with this such a diagnosis uh, don't expect to die from it. They expect to live with the condition, uh, but to be able to manage their symptoms. What's most important for somebody with this diagnosis then becomes other um, other outcomes beyond survival, which they assume. Um, and those are, you know, can be categorized around severe erectile dysfunction, incontinence, uh, and similar ones like this. Now, the data that I'm showing here is, um, again, for Germany, not to pick out Germany per se, um, but just to give you a sense of this is data that was collected by a German payer association across all of the different uh, hospitals that provide uh, prostate cancer services to patients. And there are over 300 of these uh, in Germany versus uh, what some would argue is the largest and leading center, uh, the Martini Clinic in Hamburg, which is a spin out of the University of Hamburg Clinic, which focuses purely on uh, patients with a prostate cancer diagnosis. And you can see that they have a 2x better rate uh, of outcomes on severe erectile dysfunction and a 6x uh, better rate on incontinence. So this is data that would any patient uh, would want if they had a prostate cancer diagnosis. I would want this for my father, for my brother, for my husband, for my uncle, um, et cetera. But it's data that unfortunately we just don't have uh, as a parent for all of our diagnoses uh, to help us inform the where we go for care. But I just want to give you a flavor for what we mean when we talk about outcomes that matter to patients. The next question I frequently get is, okay, that's great, but uh, how do we define outcomes that matter to patients? And so I wanted to share for a moment uh, just a quick overview of an organization called ICHOM. It stands for the International Consortium for Health Outcome Measurement. It's an independent not-for-profit that was founded over 10 years ago uh, by BCG, together with Michael Porter, who wrote the original value-based healthcare book, and the Karolinska Institute. So I think three different um, complementary uh, sets of capabilities in those three organizations. And what ICHOM has done over its 10 plus year uh, trajectory is to work with le leading experts. So these are clinicians, the, these are leaders of registries, uh, as well as patients and or patient representatives in all of the different groups they've uh, come across so far, far to develop a small set, the, the minimum standard set, if you will, of outcomes for a particular population segment. So as you can see here, the first four that were done back in, in over 10 years ago now, cataracts, coronary artery disease, localized prostate cancer, and lower back pain. Those are for specific diagnoses with a medical condition behind it. There are others, however, uh, which are more for a life uh, stage. So there's one in the, in the second to right column that you can see there, there's overall adult health, overall pediatric health. So in addition to people who have a specific diagnosis, ICHUM has also developed uh, from existing measures, uh, a recommended set of outcomes to track uh, in a standardized manner um, for people uh, overall adult health. So you can see some of the statistics on who uses these and where they're used, et cetera. Uh, ITOM is not-for-profit. They have uh, uh, free for use uh, available for download. Um, in addition to the actual measures themselves, they also give guidelines on what are the risk adjustment um, metrics to use uh, to help uh, correlate uh, outcome measurement and, and comparison uh, to help foster learning collaboratives. Um, as well as they also give some guidelines on the timing. So when should these be measured uh, post uh, procedure or post diagnosis um, over the life uh, uh, of uh, a chronic disease as well. So just, just a little bit about where um, 
a global uh, resource for outcomes uh, that are used today, uh, compiled by uh, over a thousand experts uh, for each of these sets, which cover, as you can see in the title here, over what we sp spend, over 55% of what we spend on, on healthcare in terms of the disease burden. So if we move on from outcomes then uh, into patient-centric care delivery, the question then becomes, okay, well, uh, that seems, as I mentioned before, somewhat obvious, but what does it mean in terms of practice and how does that translate into how different uh, provider organizations organize themselves to deliver that? And effectively, the these are logos of some of the organizations that we look at in the book, how they have moved themselves uh, more towards a value-based um, environment. And so on the on the horizontal axis here, you can see there's basically a differentiation between those who do more of a gradual approach. Um, in other words, patient population by patient population versus those who did more of a transformational big bang, uh, do everything at once approach. And then on the on the vertical axis here, you can see that um, there are some organizations that have begun from their origin to have a value based healthcare focus. Uh, more recently, an organization like Oak Street Health uh, in the U.S., which serves elderly uh, above 65 and uh, typically not so well off uh, in terms of socioeconomic status, um, versus the older, um, uh, some of the older organizations like Kaiser Permanente, who from its founding days uh, was focused on prevention. It served the ship yard workers uh, in, in California and wanted to make sure that it could keep its, um, its population healthy uh, and in the workforce. Um, to more of a, a, a change legacy model where I have an existing hospital or a group of hospitals, how can I over time incre incrementally introduce value-based healthcare? And so a good example of that is the Santion Group. So let me take a moment and highlight what the Santion Group is. The Santion Group is actually seven independent private hospitals in the Netherlands. And you can see there, Netherlands is a small country, but they're fairly well distributed geographically uh, across the country. And how this came about is effectively the seven independent CEOs um, decided that they wanted to develop what they called learning collaboratives, a learning system uh, across their institutions. In other words, they felt that, you know, their catchment areas weren't overlapping, they weren't necessarily direct competitors, but uh, given that they mostly had the same medical education system, the same training system for their doctors and nurses, why couldn't they uh, collaborate to learn from each other who did what better uh, and how they could uh, identify more quickly those best practices? to go back and, and, and tackle that evidence crisis that I mentioned up front. And so what they've done is actually um, a couple of patient populations by patient population. They've now gone through 16 of these different patient groups where they jointly take representatives from each of the seven different hospitals uh, and a multidisciplinary team. So for example, in the breast cancer group, they would gather an oncologist, a, a surgeon, um, a nurse who helped with rehab post-surgery, um, et cetera. So there's a, a multitude of specialties and disciplines that are represented in the group, in addition to having patient representatives in each of these groups as well. And within each group, then they would define what they call their scorecard, uh, which are typically 10 to 20 measures that were uh, majority outcomes, um, reflecting back on what I was just talking about, but also a couple process measures um, and a couple measures around cost drivers. In other words, what are the biggest uses of our resources not the euro spend necessarily, but rather um, because they didn't want to get into salary differences and how uh, you know the mix of professionals might be different in one hospital versus the other, but rather you know operating theater usage time or um, you know a scan time and a scan number of scans that were done uh, pre and post op, et cetera. So uh, the real cost drivers rather than the the actual uh, dollars and cents or or euros and cents. And so what's been the impact of this over time? So they started uh, back in 2015. And I wanted to share with you some of the published findings uh, that they have uh, put forth on breast cancer specifically, because that was one of the first groups that they started with. So they found that there was really high unexpected variation, even in a small country and with seven institutions. There was a 4x difference uh, in their reoperation rate uh, between the best performers and the worst performers uh, before they started to do this, um, this exercise. So 
what you see here are each of the seven hospitals and then the average uh, in green. Um, and this is cycle one versus cycle three. So what they do is every six months um, and they have a, a new cycle. So cycle one to cycle three are 18 months uh, or 12 months actually. Cycle one happens at month zero, cycle two at month six and cycle three then at month 12. Uh, and you can see the improvement. So um, they share data among themselves, as I mentioned, in that standardized uh, way for the 10 to 20 measures that they may have among breast cancers specifically. And here, what we're looking at is the um, reoperation rate um, because they had to go back in and reoperate on a patient uh, after the initial operation because there was still cancerous tissue left behind. And you can see that by sharing their data and talking specifically about the way they did the surgery, uh, the way that they uh, made scans during uh, while a patient was still under anesthesia, et cetera, they were able, uh, able to bring down their reoperation rate overall by 17%. Um, and the worst performer was able to improve by uh, 64% within the space of a year. So that's pretty dramatic improvement. Now, the question I get is, okay, well, some of these are actually getting worse. Why is that? Um, and I think the, the, just to keep in mind here, this was one uh, of the of the measures that they were looking at. So, you know, for example, um, uh, number hospital number five or number six, uh, which showed a, a marginal um, worsening in this particular one, may have been an outlier uh, on a different measure and have put more resources and more focus on improving something else. So each of the hospitals had the liberty uh, to select which measures they wanted to focus on improving, um, and they could have the benefit of, of sharing that among the, the professionals as they come together every six months to discuss. And the other thing I think that this really does is it brings the data in, it brings the patient perspective in, it focuses on really what makes a difference, helps weed through some of the confusing sometimes information about um, uh, evidence-based guidelines, but it really engages the professional team again. So, you know, when you go back and you hear from some of the people about their experience working with these outcome measures and the tracking in the population segments, um, they, they really feel like they have data they can use, they get closer to their patients, um, they feel the positive sense of learning, um, uh, and they're not being penalized for, um, for the results, but rather using it as a, as a real learning opportunity. So it was a great way uh, for this particular group of hospitals to go beyond um, uh, their work and, and really address that workforce crisis issue um, by bringing the, the clinical teams back together and focusing on what mattered most for the patients. So if I switch gears then to the third um, third category around incentivizing for value, not volume, um, I just wanted to put up on the screen a couple of the behaviors that are most critical uh, for focusing on. And again, this isn't necessarily to say that you need to set up value-based contracting or that you need to pay for outcomes because in fact, I think that can be quite difficult. There are many confounding factors that make that hard to do. But as you think through, if you're involved in, in setting payment uh, guidelines or incentive guidelines, what are the real behaviors that we want in our healthcare system or in our hospital system, et cetera? Um, and how can we make sure that we accentuate that or at least don't um, uh, incentivize in the opposite direction, right? So um, included in these, as you can see on the page, is the prioritization of wellness, making sure we spend uh, appropriately in the proper screenings and the proper annual visits, with the high risk population um, so that we can uh, prevent the, the worsening of disease, which is obviously gonna drive uh, high cost users into the healthcare system. Um, focusing on the behavior of engaging with patients, making sure that we are aware of what is the patient's desired outcome um, so we can have better choices made in, uh, in conjunction with the patient and their wishes. Um, as we talked about before in the knee replacement, making sure that we're always offering high quality appropriate treatments um, with an emphasis on those procedures or activities that we know have a positive impact on patient outcomes. Um, and also uh, in terms of uh, responsibility for the resources, making sure that we use those uh, in a, a smart way. If you think back to that curve of healthcare costs growing faster than our GDP, 
we can't do that forever. Uh, and so one of the behaviors we want to incentivize is making sure that the clinical teams have transparency around the spend, transparency around the value, um, and we give them a joint responsibility for managing the total costs of the system. I don't want to go into great detail uh, on the value-based payment models, but we uh, I'm more than happy to go into it if there are questions around it. But basically, we see um, three different angles to this that have worked well in the examples that we've seen across the globe. One is paper performance bonuses, and these are fairly small. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about 50% uh, payment here, but, you know, more in the range of 5 to 10, uh, slightly over 10% uh, of uh, an additional performance um, bonus that can be paid if it, uh, outcomes are achieved. Um, but more importantly, I think there's an emphasis on bundled payments if it's a discrete um, cycle of care. So joint replacement, I think, works its well way well into bundled payments. And there's some great examples of that around the world where that uh, is incentivizing improved outcomes uh, and a lower uh, total care. Um, and finally, capitation. So capitation is more relevant for a population. Uh, it's more relevant for chronic conditions. And the benefit of a capitated model is it must be tried to outcomes measurement. So we don't want to get into a rationing system, um, but it also gives the autonomy back to clinical teams. So they can uh, use the money uh, and the resources in the way that they feel is most beneficial to improving the outcomes for that particular patient. So on the fourth one then, uh, you know, data, technology, digital tools, there's not a day that goes by when there's not uh, an, a slew of articles that mention um, great uh, forward momentum, the least of which uh, not being a generative AI and where we're going with that. Uh, but, you know, I think sometimes uh, there's a lot behind this that, that's driving the growth. Um, there are estimates that say a third of all data generated daily is related to health uh, currently, and that's probably going to grow over time uh, as we get more interconnected, more devices, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that, right? So we have the digitization of what used to be done on paper and in charts, et cetera. We also have increasing sophistication of technology. So what used to have an MRI um, a, a number of years ago now has 10x the, the number of data points um, uh, generated simply because we have more pixels, we have more uh, sophisticated MRI uh, technology behind that. Uh, we also have a high demand from consumers uh, who want um, to be more connected, more telehealth, et cetera, all of which drives an additional uh, development of, of data. But, you know, if you look at healthcare overall versus other industries, um, you see that we lag behind in healthcare. We have not gotten as much out of the digitalization uh, and the tools to help us make better decisions that improve value uh, as we have in some other industries. So there's still a ways to go. So I guess that's the good news. Um, and I'm not gonna, for the interest of time, I won't go through this chart in detail, but I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, afterwards on that. Uh, but basically the view of how we can start to use standardized outcomes data uh, and the digital tools around that uh, to feed into a global learning network. So uh, similar to the Santion example, but writ globally, uh, I think is a, is a vision that we aspire to. But if I move on to the fifth uh, uh, unlock then, what's needed from policymakers? What do we actually uh, think about uh, in terms of what works well from value-based healthcare Who's leading on this and what are they doing? And so there are a number of different, uh, both regional and country level governments, uh, ministries of health and the like, who have who've made strides forward in this. And you can see some of their, their flags depicted here on the slide. But essentially it comes down to three different steps. The first is around really defining the mission. So what should um, the mission of the Ministry of Health and or the, the healthcare system overall strive to be? And more specifically then, what are the structural changes that are in the way uh, and how can we help get around those? Beyond defining the mission though, I think it's also critical that policymakers help shape the market. Um, part of that starts with mandating a comprehensive standardized outcome measurement so that we can use that as the basis for uh, learning, for improvement, et cetera. Uh, 
It's also about investing in our uh, digital platforms so that we can have a common platform, um, interoperable, uh, working across our different silos that we have today. Um, and also uh, the incentives, uh, making sure that our incentives are aligned so that we can better use our scarce resources uh, in smart ways to improve value. And finally, you know, we did a thought experiment around placing game-changing bets. Now, different countries um, are obviously funded in different ways in their healthcare system. Uh, but overall, if we think that there is truly somewhere between 20 and 40 percent waste, even there's less than that uh, in all the healthcare spend, there is room to think about how we can invest some of that uh, waste in ways that are going to be um, uh, game changing bets. In other words, how can we work across silos in pre-competitive space um, to create national resources that then can connect internationally in terms of patient value, IT standards, uh, et cetera. Now, some of these things already exist. There are examples of these out there. Um, some of you may know H2O, which is the Health Outcomes Observatory here in Europe, um, which is forming as we speak in a number of countries, focused on leveraging patients uh, and patient reported outcomes uh, to drive the improvement cycle. But other things like that, I think there's room for uh, driving this forward in terms of policymakers taking uh, a more active role, if you will. Which leads me then to the sixth and, and final element uh, of leadership. And so we reflect about uh, what types of leadership are those that we see as being successful in the organizations we highlighted uh, in the research for the book. There are three different levels. The first is strategic leadership. In other words, within my own organization, within my own four walls, um, believing that we are moving more towards a value-based world, how can I help shape the strategy uh, so that I can uh, both survive, but then more importantly, thrive and then compete in a value-based world uh, is the first level. Beyond that though, there's a transformational level. This is where I think the hardest part comes. Value-based healthcare is a concept that it's hard to disagree with on some levels, but the devil is in the details and the actual transformation that needs to take place uh, where there's a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia in the way that organizations have worked uh, for many years uh, is tough to do. And so this change management element, helping the people within organizations change their work that they do um, and reorient around becoming a value-based organization, we talk through in the book a number of the different traits that are uh, we see as most successful in those that have led the transformation of their own organizations. And then third and, and final in terms of uh, leadership is the system level leadership. So this goes beyond the four walls of our own institution. It goes beyond the silos uh, uh, that may happen between pharma, med tech, payers, providers, et cetera, and thinks more about you know, how can we uh, collaborate? What are the common goods that we need to develop jointly? Um, where uh, some of this is around standardized outcome measures. Some of this is around uh, transparency uh, on digital platforms. But where can we uh, collaborate in ways that will behoove us all uh, and recognize that there are scarce resources uh, to put this in place? And so there's a couple of examples that you can see here on that page. I recognize that I did that fairly quickly, uh, but I wanted to uh, just highlight once uh, before we close that if ICHOM and the International Consortium of Health Outcomes Measures is something that interests you, they have their uh, annual conference coming up in October this year in Barcelona. Um, so I would encourage you to look into that. Uh, and then let me thank you uh, for uh, joining and staying with us uh, and it'll for, up for conversation. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I don't know, Alison, if you want to, um, to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, this, is, this is really interesting. One thing you mentioned with the breast cancer, uh, the breast cancer research is that some of these hospitals may have lowered and lowered their outcomes related to the, that specific breast cancer measure, um, maybe because they were focusing on improving other measures. And I think we see that a lot, or that's been my observation at, um, in the UK for the NHS is when they incentivize reducing wait times for cancer treatment, that means wait times for other specialties go way up. Have you, 
what's your perspective on that? Is it an inevitable trade-off? How do you mitigate it? How do you think about it? That's a great question. Um, and one of the things that I think value-based healthcare does not do is help you prioritize you know, between one population segment and the next population segment. It's not around that. And that's something that you know I think needs to be worked out in terms of funding levels uh, by policymakers. It needs to be worked out um, ideally over time also among institutions by transparency of outcomes. So it should be that by competing on outcomes, those who do it well, i.e. in the prostate cancer example, the Martini Clinic, rise to the top, they get more volume, and those who do you know, one patient every two months uh, won't be able to do that anymore uh, because their outcomes are subpar. So I think there's something around by competing on outcomes over time, the you'll drive the the medium the the median up as well as improve the 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 overall levels um but i agree with you 100% it's not a, it doesn't help you uh prioritize one population segment versus another population segment just a follow up question to that how does how does that competition differ in uh in countries like the uk and the nordic countries versus the us and where you have a uh, mix of public and private hospitals and the US predominantly dominated by non nonprofit or non non public hospitals. Yeah. yeah. It's a great question. I think unfortunately in any of the countries that you just mentioned we don't know enough about the outcomes, right? So what are people competing on today? People are competing on metrics which are set forth by various regulators. Uh, so in, in the US, for example, um, they compete on the HEDIS star ratings, they compete on, you know, various other um, uh, measures which either CMS or other agencies put forth on a way for reimbursement in the public system, or even outside the public system um, on their own particular ratings. They're not comparable, which is part of the problem uh, from one uh, uh, provider system to the next provider system. And I think you can easily optimize on some of the process measures and not necessarily get better value or better outcomes for the patient. So, you know, one of the things that we're advocating is really uh, more of a top down mandate on outcomes um, that matter most to patients, because that will hopefully drive uh, competition on the basis of using scarce resources um, to improve the outcomes for patients, as opposed to optimizing, um, you know, uh, operating theater time or uh, some of the, if you look at the HEDIS measures, about 10 to 12% of them are outcomes. The majority, vast majority are not outcomes. They're actually process measures. Um, thank you for the presentation, of course, but also for all the work in the this uh, last years uh, on putting together all this together because even if value-based healthcare is something that we hear a lot, um, there's controversy uh, around it, and there's a need to uh, embrace some common grounds to be able to communicate between health providers and not only. Um, and then, and so there's um, gets the your last point, and maybe for me one of the most important. Leading the um, value-based healthcare means leading the change of health and healthcare per se in the system um, and these um, uh, demands um, capacities of integrating all the different stakeholders all the different um, abilities of these changes for example as you mentioned coming from silos uh, on providers to an integrated uh, integration of care and of course then get uh, of course if we need information and outcomes measurements for this the importance of data and reliable data and that's why you mentioned so many times germany of course to, to grab some consistency but definitely that uh, is very important and so uh, just to, to get to to my question for those that don't know ecom um, and their work on measurement definition it's very interesting precisely the difference 
that uh, on putting uh, for each disease or each, each condition different outcomes that are centered to, uh, to the patient in the different uh, dimensions uh, of the human mind um, becomes uh, a huge revolution from what we have until now and it's the most traditional way of thinking. And so that's where precisely you mentioned that one of the biggest challenges is the definition of the population segments. So since this is an approach not only on management de delivery of services, it's also a system approach. And so again, there gets the competition, the collaboration between uh, providers. And sometimes to make the best for all population, uh, depending on what we define, we uh, the hospitals will have to um, go down in some parameters uh, at the individual level. So here the population health planning becomes really important and that's why the, the importance then also for policymakers to give the right incentives because depending on what outcomes are measured more than those be, being the change uh, that will produce, it's about uh, what we um, define as the most important for, for example, clinicians to focus on. And so here becomes my question is, um, where do we find still the biggest uh, resistance to this, this change? Because definitely a lot, a very complex situation, but um since it it depends on each country in each system and even uh, locally um this uh, brings um challenges that can difficultly be defined i don't know if i i would be clear enough on my question uh so i guess you're asking what are the biggest barriers is that right Yes, precisely. I think in this uh, on uh, on this change between individual and population level, and uh, also in the difference between probably countries, countries and within countries, as you very well uh, showed. Yeah. So I guess the measures that ICHOM puts together, they don't define them. So they're measures that are actually in use already. Um, somewhere in the world, if not many places in the world. What the ICHOM sets try and do is say, what are the small number of things that we should measure in a common way to facilitate faster and better learning uh, in terms of identifying the best practices? So, you know, those are meant to be uh, measured at individual person uh, level. In other words, I as a, if I were had a patient in front of me with a breast cancer diagnosis, it would be up to me to help figure out together with the patient, what are the outcomes that are most important to you? Because of that, you know, uh, what are other patients who are similar risk profile to you, et cetera, what are their outcomes look like in these different procedures and these different treatment options? Um, so it should be, irregardless of treatment option, it should include multiple treatment options and help make uh, informed decision-making for the doctor together with uh, his or her patient. Then it gets uh, built up at an institution level um, to then more of a population to say, OK, well, overall, I'm seeming to have a better or worse performance on go back to the same example, reoperation rate of cancerous tissue um, in my hospital versus your hospital. Let's talk about, you know, what do I do as a surgeon versus what do you do as a surgeon? What do we do differently and what drives that difference and how can I learn from you so that I can, uh, you know, help to get up to that same level? So. The same measures are designed to be used at an individual level and then combined up to a population level. So I think that's a, a critical point. So it's it's not about um, taking samples. It's not about taking averages. It's supposed to be a tool that informs the, the clinical slash patient relationship, as well as serves as an aggregated form with risk adjustment uh, to be able to help draw um, the learnings out of it so you can get to improve best practices. I don't know if that helped answer your question. Definitely, but then the alignment precisely. But yes, it's first individual, and then what gets to uh, to the population level and the, the variances that we find. Uh, yeah. later on. I don't know if P Professor Alex, you want to I, ask. <laughs> on I have another question also. <laughs> when you're done, Professor Carter. <laughs> well, thanks. I'll I'll jump in then and say 
Jen, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm sorry I missed um, a chunk of it, but thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present uh, with us today. Um, I, I guess my question is relatively simple in that uh, you've done the research for the book and you've identified the unlocks. And so I'm, I'm curious to know what your assessment of the literature on value-based healthcare is. You know, how good is it? What's the quality of the evidence that we have to inform our activities here? Uh, we obviously have some activities to work on through the book, but what's your assessment of the quality of the evidence informing what we do next? So I wouldn't be a good consultant if I didn't say it depends. Yeah. <laughs> but I, think it, <laughs> I think it really does vary, right? So I think there are um, there are some standout places where there's been some great research done. Uh, and I think it, some of that is quite old at this point, but I, I think it doesn't negate the, the power of it. So I think where there's good research done is coming out of some of the disease registries, coming out of some of the work um, that's related to uh, the outcomes measurement, et cetera, where it's clear from some of the evidence that we see in some of the articles that we've read that measuring the outcomes in a standardized way helps foster the conversation and helps get to identified best practices much faster than say the evidence-based guideline approach. Because as you know better than I, evidence-based guidelines take five to 15 to more years to get into practice. By the time they're there, they're sometimes already outdated, if not outdated shortly thereafter. Um, and the, in, the ingoing research that gets into those evidence-based guidelines is strictly strictly defined in terms of um, a lot of inclusion or exclusion criteria, which doesn't necessarily make it relevant for the entire population. Um, so I think that um, although we may not have as much evidence and uh, research on value-based healthcare as we would like, the other standard that we do have, I think, is flawed in many ways that we are sometimes blind or oblivious to. Um, and so I think that the increasing body of research as it develops around the use of outcomes and how that drives improvement faster uh, in a more flexible way um, is, is pretty powerful. Uh, thanks for that answer, yeah. And I, I suspect it's um, the closing of loops and how we follow up on the closing of loops is a real area of research that we, we simply have uh, underappreciated, which is where I think in my estimation enters the implementation scientists. Yeah. Their teeth sunk into value-based healthcare and have models for assessing how well these loops are closed and perhaps just how much value is, uh, is, is realized end, end to end to use systems thinking. Right. Yeah. But, that is, is, again, incredibly useful to, to get your sense of, of the quality of the evidence and, and where, you know, some of the good examples lie. So, so thanks for that. And I'll, I'll pass over to my, uh, uh, our colleagues. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, uh, another thought that just comes to mind is that one of the beauties, I think, of, uh, of looking at outcomes as a starting point as opposed to uh, more of the very strict uh, criterion to, to limit is that you also identify innovation faster, valuable innovation. Um, so, you know, the things that uh, are, are surprising, uh, you can uncover those in a faster way um, by starting by measuring the result and then figuring out how you got there, uh, as opposed to saying, I'm gonna optimize to get here. Uh, and, you know, you, you lose a lot of the innovation along the way that's valuable. Well, I like that because that conjures the more realist approach in all of this. Um, I mean, you, you know, from a from a hierarchy of evidence or our obsession with hierarchy of evidence, you have randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, maybe quasi experimental approaches. Then you have at the other end this emerging realist approach, realist reviews, realist synthesis, realist evaluations. And in the realist sense, you do say, well, what do we get to? And let's reverse engineer from that because that's what really happened. And then we'll we're always muddling through. So let's embrace what really happened and the muddling through that occurred. And, and maybe we'll actually find better ways, uh, better paths forward and prototype better solutions on that basis. So that's bringing a few strands of other literature into my, uh, into my focus. Um, yeah. And so the whole complex adaptive system, this is, it's so complex. It's not manufacturing. I mean, there's so many other elements that come into it. Uh, biology alone is is so complex, but then um, the system and the intercomplexities and the interdependencies that are there um, 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of promise, I think, behind measuring this outcomes and starting there and, and working backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're uh, kindred spirits in systems thinking in that case. And, uh, and I think that's, again, a crucial sort of starting point or overarching theme for value-based healthcare, dare I say. But it's, it's what it sounds like, at least. Yeah, no, I think so. And value-based healthcare as a term, I think, has, you know, come and gone. It's gotten good reviews, bad reviews. People don't necessarily understand it. It's used many ways to try and mean something that is very different. Um, but the complex adaptive systems thinking, um, starting by measuring the result, I think is a is a sometimes a better way, although more complex in terms of explaining. I think that's a better frame of mind to think about. Thank you. Thanks for that. And another question. Let me hand over the baton. I, I can ask another question. If, okay, I'll go for it. Um, so yeah, speaking of the complexity of outcome measures, if I'm putting myself in the provider perspective, and again, I'm using my US experience for this, um, Medicare has thousands of quality measures. And then there's Medicare and every private insurer, Medicaid, you have just so many different quality measures that you're constantly trying to navigate between. How, how do you see providers effectively managing that and sort of sifting through the hundreds of measures they might need to focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I think CMS and CMMI specifically are yeah. really wrestling with. And you, I mean, it sounds like you've already lived this in, in greater detail than <laughs> yeah. I have. Um, but, you know, they published a paper not so long ago, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, that took a look back at the first 10 years of CMMI experimentation and basically said, eh, we didn't get a whole lot out of that. Um, it cost us a lot. It was great from the sense of experimentation. We learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but as, as you're alluding to, in, in many instances, there were competing aims. So as a hospital leadership team, you didn't know necessarily if you wanted to go for this bundled payment for this population group or this alternative payment contract for a, another population group because they had competing aims. Sometimes they had the same patients in them. Um, it wasn't clear where you would uh, make more money, lose more money. I mean, it, so I, I think they have recognized that. And when we've, we've spoken with a number of leaders from CMS and CMMI, um, they're really looking to reduce uh, the number of measures that they use um, and bring it more in, into a, a, a more reasonable format. So there's consistency across their programs. Uh, and then there's a smaller number. So at the end of the day, there are people who are probably gaming the system um, be, just because it was so complex and there was room to do that. Um, but then there was the inadvertent uh, gaming of the system as well, that you know people weren't necessarily trying to uh, do poorly or, or go against the rules, but it was just so complex, it was hard to know which was which. And so um, because a lot of them were voluntary programs, people just chose not to participate or not to continue uh, because they thought this is getting too complex, too far away from my core. Um, I'm paid fee for service. I'm That's why I'm incentivized. I'm going to continue down the original path. So uh, to include, I think that CMS and CMMI are working hard to come up with a smaller set of rational measures. Uh, and I know that, you know, historically, NQF, which is the National Quality Foundation, had been working to define the quality measures that then would be implemented as part of CMS, um, which covers, uh, you know, more than half of the spend. Um, but that has that contract has recently changed to another organization who will look now to, to get to a smaller number of, of measures uh, for CMS. From a system perspective, is it easier to implement in universal healthcare systems, like in Europe, when you look at different? I think so. I mean, I think uh, if CMS were to um, to mandate, um, say, a small number of outcome measures uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, I think all of the private payers would soon thereafter follow, uh, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, providers have to deal with complexity um, uh, of a range of different payment models. So, uh, you know, it behooves private payers to follow the lead of, of CMS, uh, which is the lion's share of the market. Uh, because they know that in the providers, there are scarce resources to deal with the payments and the and the finances. So 
there should be some common rules, ideally, among all the payment models, private and payer, uh, private and public payers. Uh, but I think you're getting to a great point. In the more uh, universal healthcare markets, it's easier to set that mandate. It's easier to have one sort of version of truth, if you will. Uh, I think the Netherlands is a great example. Um, for a number of years, uh, they have been pursuing, they published, I think, back in 2018, what they called outcomes-based healthcare, um, which started with transparent, consistent measurement of outcomes. Um, and they actually pushed through parliament um, a, a guideline to use ICHOM measures uh, as a starting point um, uh, for outcome measures. And so that obviously was um, a little bit delayed because of COVID, as was everything else in the world in terms of healthcare uh, transformation. <laughs> Uh, but they're they're still working through that. Um, and I was on a call with somebody uh, who was at the Ministry of Health uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they're still very much pursuing that same objective in terms of rolling out standardized outcome measures, uh, more of a top down approach. Let me uh, ask you another question, precisely uh, you're mentioning um, the work that the government uh, in general in the Netherlands are doing. What do you feel is the role process of governments and regulation on already what you mentioned uh, on incentivizing or pursuing what should be the framework to implement? Uh, because we feel that this is much more um, simulated by the providers organizations, I think. So, yeah, I guess, you know, if you think about it from a regulator's perspective or um, a Ministry of Health type of, of perspective, what's most critical from our perspective on that in terms of pushing for value? Uh, uh, it's got to be around, um, there are pockets of innovation in any system, regardless of, of where you are. If you're in the U.S., uh, very fragmented, or if you're in uh, more of a centralized uh, system like the Netherlands. There is pockets of innovation. I think the question then becomes, why do we not see more of those pockets of innovation? What does it take? What is prohibiting more of those uh, pockets of innovation from rising to the forefront? In other words, what policies or what incentives uh, might be out there that are limiting innovation, that are limiting uh, value-based contracting, that are limiting transparency of outcomes, and so that they can, uh, you know, rework those policies or, or remove them. So I think there's that element of it, removing stuff that is inhibiting uh, innovation. And then on the other side, there's the, there's the promoting, um, I would argue for promoting standardized outcome measurement um, as a starting point uh, and thinking through what does it take to do that? What are the resources needed? Not to say that they need to micromanage um, because I think governments are typically poor at, at getting that level of detail right but fostering an environment where there's public-private uh, partnerships uh, to push forth on uh, how best to measure outcomes, what's the right digital platform to put in place, uh, how is that gonna interact with uh, all of the providers' current systems that they have, um, how can we bring in the patient reported outcomes to that, et cetera. So I think the policymakers have those two main things, removing policies that are limiting innovation. Um, so the, the, the true test there is, there are pockets, why are there not more pockets of that? And then putting forward more positive uh, recommendations and policies in terms of um, the outcomes and the other unlocks. So in, in some way also, it's uh, maybe showing precisely the evidence and the clear evidence of this, those policies evaluate. So bringing again, standardizing of measurements and outcomes to the policies too. Thank yep. you very much. I don't know if there's any more questions. If no, I, I do have an. Okay. <laughs> I can keep going if you can. If I if I'm I'll not taking up other Jennifer. people's space. <laughs> Is, do you still have time? Sure. I, I one more. Oh, okay. Um, when you're incentivizing different value based or people to adopt different value based outcomes, I. In the US, I imagine a lot of the incentive has to come, oh, if you do this, it'll ultimately be cost saving. Or that that was a leading question. I guess more, what do you, how is it different between different countries and different health systems, how, how you incentivize providers to adopt outcome-based measures? Is it that it's cost saving? Is it that it's better for the patient? Is it that it's more sustainable for the entire healthcare system? 
what it's are those sort of selling points? And I think, again, the answer is it depends, right? So I think that if you think back to what are the three crises, outcome measurement can actually address all three of those, right? So in the first, we have the value crisis. We're spending infinitely more. Some percentage of that is waste, and we're not getting better outcomes. So by measuring the outcomes, then we can reverse engineer, figure out what works best to get to those better outcomes and start to do a faster rollout of best practices. That'll also help remove costs that are um, not contributing to better outcomes, uh, as well as you know, improving for, for, for patients. It'll also address ideally the evidence crisis where we talked about before the fact that there's a growing disconnect before where we spend trillions of dollars, mostly by industry, um, uh, on um, the next best uh, innovation or the next best drug, which is critical, uh, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't necessarily help the clinical teams make better decisions about what's most relevant for the particular patient they have in front of him or her. So it's bringing those two together and by measuring outcomes, uh, following up, as, as Professor Carter was saying, something has occurred. Uh, how do we get to this point? And what were the steps that we, uh, where, when a positive thing has occurred, what were the steps that got us to there and how can we replicate that at scale? And then it also goes back to the fact that uh, clinical teams and, and doctors and nurses um, have a historical streak. They've probably been top of their class throughout their, their education. They don't have the data today to compare themselves necessarily based on outcomes. When you give them the data on outcomes, it helps them um, with better autonomy uh, because they, uh, and especially if you tie uh, the incentives and their payment to um, better outcomes, it, it gives them a, a bundle of money and says, look, and this is a true for, you know, some uh, joint replacement bundles that take, uh, that are in the, Nether uh, that are in um, uh, the Nordic countries. Um, you as a team get X amount, um, call it a hundred. You can spend that 100 for each patient as you see fit. In some patients, you may want to spend that on a higher cost device. Um, on some patients, you may want to spend more on the rehab because uh, the patient uh, has an active lifestyle and it occurred not because of old age or in the fall, but because uh, of a traffic accident. Um, and so, you know, you therefore as a doctor and a clinical team have more autonomy into how you best use that to achieve better outcomes. So it all, I think, goes to the reason for measuring outcomes um, addresses all three of those crises. And I think the argumentation uh, goes to what's, who are you in the system? What's your starting point uh, in which of what speaks to you more in terms of the right set of evidence to bring? Thank you. Thank you very much again, Jennifer. Um, I think then we'll close the, this talk today. Um, and so I wish you all the luck and all the, the continuing uh, the good work with Stephen Larson and all the colleagues. Um, and I wish uh, a good um, evening to everyone in Madrid, London and elsewhere where you, you may be. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks again for the opportunity and happy to continue the conversation afterwards. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.